But here's the beauty of being small gardeners, being in our own yards. The beauty of that is you get to control it all. I mean, honestly, you don't have to destroy a thing. You get to actually regenerate things. You get to give back. You get to build more soil, get to call in the pollinators that you want to pollinate your vegetables and fruits and everything else. You need all of that. And um, so not harming that ecosystem is just as important as getting the food that you want. In fact, I think, I think it, you, you wouldn't have the food that you want if you harmed the entire ecosystem. So the point, it all goes together. And there's ways, you know, depending on what you're trying to grow and what you're doing, there are ways to make that happen. Welcome to Inside Ideas with me, Mark Buckley. We will be speaking to regenerative futurists, game changers, systemic change and about desirable futures with those who want to see us on the right side of history brought to you by 1.5 media innovators magazine and sponsored by the alohas regenerative foundation Chris McLaughlin is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas. Master gardener and modern homesteader, Chris has been gardening and studying plants for over 40 years. She's the author of nine books. Her latest book is The Good Garden, How to Nurture Pollinators, Soil, Native Wildlife, and Healthy Food, all in your own backyard. Chris's book, promises to give you all the tips, the tricks that you need to grow a sustainable garden of your dreams on your own with the tools that you need for where you're at. The good garden is about growing healthiest and most scrumptious fruits, vegetables as possible, as absolutely possible for you, for your life, for where you're at and whatever environment you're in. But it's also about giving back, giving back to the earth, environment, to nature, to other species. How can you and your little patch of earth become a sanctuary for threatened wildlife, sequester carbon, and nurture native plants? Well, Chris answers those questions in her very exhaustive book of tips, tricks, and all sorts of fun facts that everyone needs to know to get on the right side of gardening, to start out right without the hair pulling and frustrations that some of us may have felt in the past. She's drawing from established traditions such as permaculture, the French intensive gardening, and hard earned experience. For newbies, this is uh, an experience and experienced gardeners alike it will teach the fundamentals, including how to choose the right plant varieties, your microclimate, and proven methods to fight pests without chemicals. You will also discover nuances of developing a green thumb and picking species to attract specific type of pollinators, uh, clear down to composting techniques based on time available in, in your day, um, and through lovely photography in this book. So. We don't want to give your give Chris's book away and read it for you. We want to tease you enough so that you say, hey, I've been thinking about getting into gardening. I've been thinking about homesteading. I've been thinking about some of these things. And where is the book? Uh, Chris's book is really the good in the gardener. It's, it makes sense to get it. It's an exhaustive tips and tricks pretty much for anyone. I recommend you highly get it. And I want you to know, Chris has been doing this really for 40 years. I want to tell you about some of the other um, things that she's done. So she was the associate editor from Scratch Magazine and a staff contributor to VegetableGardener.com. Her work has appeared in magazines such as Urban Farm Magazine, Hobby Farm Home Magazine, The Herb Companion, The Heirloom Gardener, and Fine Gardening Magazine. So besides the book we're talking about today, she's also written 
the complete idiot guides to composting, the complete idiot guides to heirloom vegetables, hobby farms, small space rabbit keeping, the complete idiot guides to small space gardening, vertical vegetable gardening, raising animals for fiber, a garden to die for, and growing heirloom flowers. So, wow. Okay, we've got the expert here. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you for uh, bearing with my introduction. It's so good to have you here. No, oh, that was amazing. Thank you, Mark, for having me here. I appreciate it. You're most welcome. So um, we've just kind of come through an, an amazing time, and we're still kind of, in some respects, uh, crawling and, and kicking and scratching our way through it still. Pandemic, economic downturns, you know, uh, elections, uh, Brexit and Ukraine war, and whatever other craziness that has been going on in the world. And through it all, what we've really seen is that growing your own food is like printing your own money. It's like a, a great way to sustain yourself. That's a great hobby. It's a great way to keep you connected to nature and busy during times of craziness in the world, but also um, to kind of find a way to, to still get some basics uh, out of life. Um, this book comes kind of, hopefully at the tail end of some of this craziness uh, as it's been released by Island Press. Tell me, how have you weathered that time and, and what prompted you to kind of get into the book and to write it? Is it also because you're seeing so much awareness around the world kind of and and doing it yourself, uh, getting into different modes of, of being more self-sufficient? What was yeah. some of your motivation behind it? Well, you know, uh, this was actually, to be honest, I've written a lot of books and uh, hundreds and hundreds of articles and things, but this was actually the book of my heart. It was um, a book that I actually had inside me about 20 years ago. And it was really funny. It was kind of, a, I was pitching it. It was under a different name. And, and certainly I'm kind of happy that it came now because I have learned so much more. So really I'm almost grateful it didn't happen then. But what they were saying 20 years ago to me was, um, oh, you know, this whole, you know, suburban farming situation. It just wasn't really uh, getting traction at that point. But of course, then right after that, a bunch of books came out. I was kind of like thunking my head, you know, but it was OK because really I added so much more that I wanted to say. And because I, I just kept learning and and growing and changing. Um, but, you know, one of the things, the one thing that I'm about every time I write in anything, you know, honestly, I am about putting the power back into your hands. Like, honestly, and this sounds really, really strange. I mean, the whole global things and all that, that that's one thing. But it really, all of that comes back down to the individual people. And so what I have found is, and this has been going on for, I, you know, I feel like even before the pandemic, I, I still feel like people were feeling a sense of disconnect. And, and I don't just mean with where their food came from. That's kind of an obvious thing. A lot of people are disconnected. But not just that, just out of control. I think they don't feel they, they have control of anything. And the truth is you have a lot of control. And you just, no one's really showing that to you. And what I found, you know, especially with people that were having trouble with, um, you know, even depression or just trying to find yourself, whatever that might look like. You may not be a major gardener, but gardening and growing food, um, certainly flowers, of course, and everything. But specifically, when you grow some food for yourself and you find you planted this lettuce and my goodness, y'all grow lettuce because it grows so fast. You have that on your table in no time. So it's like a really great thing to start with. Um, when they find that they actually plant the seed and they nurture it and it grows and they harvest it and they put it on the table and they are feeding their family with it. This is a whole different thing to going out and bringing home the bacon and frying it up. Okay. It's a whole different thing because you're literally doing it not figuratively, not I'm getting my paycheck from somebody else, if I still have a job, if whatever. It's, you really, really did that. So what I'm trying to get to is, is very empowering. 
And what happens is when you get that empowered feeling, it spills into the rest of your life. That's really how I've always looked at it. Um, it, it makes you feel like, my gosh, I literally fed my family. Like you can do anything if you can do that. You know, I mean, it's really cool. And what I found was a lot of people when I talk about this stuff, yes, I live on a farm. It's a small farm. It's only five acres. Um, but so I can do a lot of things, maybe a little more loosely than, than someone in the suburbs could do. Um, so for instance, I don't hide my compost piles. <laughs> They're out there. Uh, but maybe in suburbia, you might want to put a cute little fence around it or something just to make it more aesthetic. You want to be respectful of what people are looking at and seeing, because really the idea is to get everyone involved. And, um, but that all being true, um, I do everything here that I used to do in suburbia. Uh, many years ago, I used to go under the handle of a suburban farmer because I was doing all this in suburbia. I had left the farm, gone back to the Bay Area and was kind of forced to recreate my farm on this smaller area. And I did all of it. And, and it was beautiful. I mean, it was, there was nothing, you know, um, it didn't look like this cause I did it a little more aesthetically. Um, but you know, honestly, everything anyone else can do, you can do one very small part. So I just wanted to share that with people. And that was kind of the motivation. And, and also my love for wildlife was a big motivation to write this book as well. That's beautiful. Yeah. I, I have, wonderful fond memories as a child, you know, grandmother's garden going out and, and picking berries and fruits and, and, and just eating them right there out there in the garden. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when, when I was going through your book, it was really beautiful because you touch from A to Z, everything that you would need to think of when it comes to, to gardening and, um, gardening, I would say at a scale. So no matter how, how small to no matter how big you want to get. And, and that it's really a beautiful thing because everything that comes out in your book is that, how do you want it? How, how do you want it to be? What, what is right. your choice? What is your desire? And what based on this design or how you structure it and how you set up this, this garden, um, what do you believe will make it good? And I, I guess that's kind of the question to you. What makes a good garden and how, how, I mean, that's one of the first, you know, in your introduction, that's kind of how you, how you talk about it. But what really makes a good garden? Yeah. For me, when I say a good garden, um, it's really about making sure that everything is nurtured. I mean, obviously um, we want our things that we plant, whether it's flowers or, beautiful trees or shrubs or, or food. Um, we obviously want to have those things. That's why we planted them. So um, we want to be able to balance that and have all of those things and still respect our ecosystem around us and understand that not only do we not have to, um, you know, and I don't want to get into bashing, uh, you know, how we've been traditionally doing farming, although, <laughs> but that's okay. Like, you know, that's a whole different thing. But here's the beauty of being small gardeners, being in our own yards. The beauty of that is you get to control it all. I mean, honestly, you don't have to destroy a thing. You get to actually regenerate things. You get to give back. You get to build more soil. You get to call in the pollinators that you want to pollinate your vegetables and fruits and everything else. You need all of that. And um, so not harming that ecosystem is just as important as getting the food that you want. In fact, I think I think it, you, you wouldn't have the food that you want if you harmed the entire ecosystem. So the point, it all goes together. And there's ways, you know, depending on what you're trying to grow and what you're doing, there are ways to make that happen. I know that here, one of our biggest problems, if, you know, problems eating our things would be the deer. Um, we have, you know, this whole love-hate thing going on with deer because they are, beautiful and they are elegant and they are amazing and we just we watch them from the windows going about their lives and we call them there's mama and there's baby and there's dad and you know we're always you know doing all this and on the other hand when they come in and they just nail those hydrangeas to the ground i'm like oh man you know so what we decided to do was because we do have acreage we want the deer to have some of the stuff on our acreage um we just went ahead and decided anything that's food, 
our fruit tree areas, which is turning into a food forest, our vegetable gardens and things. We just fence those super tall and they just don't get that spot. That's a spot they don't get, but then they're walking around all on the outside doing their other things. So that's the way like we handle that instead of saying, you can't have any of our acreage. Um, we're, that's how we chose to do it because we enjoy the beauty of them. Um, but just, you know, to me, a good garden is definitely one that not only uh, doesn't harm things, but also gives back. We And we do funny things, give back. You know, we are um, human beings living here. We are, and that's another thing, another thing I'm trying really hard to explain to people because I've heard people act like we're interlopers somehow uh, into the natural world. We are so not interlopers. We belong here. We are part of nature. It is in us, and that's why we have to use our bigger brains as you know humans who have these brains and and be able to do what we can to preserve it and to help it and encourage it but meanwhile we do these weird things like we have livestock here so we have big big things of water right and one year this was this was about 15 years ago uh my husband went down to our horse trough it was at another farm and and a baby squirrel had drowned in the horse trough and uh, he was like, oh, man, how sad. So he kind of pulls it out and digs out a little hole and buries him, you know. And then he's on his way to work, and I see him carrying, like, a bunch of these twig things. I go, what are you doing? Because he was late. And he says, oh, I'm just going to run this down to the horse trough. And I'm like going, what? And he's like, oh, I'm building a little ladder to go in the horse trough so so they fall in, they could crawl out. And I thought, that's brilliant. <laughs> so now in all of our water things to, to feed our animals and things. And, and of course, you know, in natural ponds and stuff, little creatures die all the time. But, you know, I figure, hey, I put that big trough there. There's not an edge, you know, like a natural edge they might be able to swim to and get out. So I create one. So it's just, you know, our way of just doing something back as we had done something that may cause something. So we thought, oh, I'll try and help them out. So, I mean, you know, it's little fun things like that, that it doesn't cost anything or doesn't, you know, is it really, um, but it's just a, a, a thought of what you might be doing and then what you might do to help that situation. Absolutely. I love that. And your, your book is chock full of, of those things one after the other. So like plant hardiness zone map is, is a map in, inside of your book, kind of depending on where you live in, in the United States and and also where you can find it, uh, the same type of map and other places around the world where you can look and, and um, go get that information. So you can see, okay, well, would it make sense uh, for certain type of plants in, in, in my garden where I live? And, and then you go on to say, which is, is beautiful, is that in some gardens, there's a, like a microclimate, this, this micro system that even though you're in the middle of, you know, a desert or, or some kind of real uh, wild, cold climate that there are pockets of these microclimates that you actually can help to create as well through how you build up your garden, how you create that little ecosystem of your yard or, or, or the place where right. you're doing your garden, which I really like. Um why do you, why did you decide to include that? What, what what was your your main reason to go into such detail? Right. Uh, well, with microclimates, what what I like to tell first of all, I'm like a, you know, I do talk about um, you know the zones and you know where different plants can go in different parts of the country, and and those are all well and good and they serve a, a great purpose. I mean, obviously, if you want to put blueberry bushes in and it's not going to survive in your area, then, you know, blueberry bushes have to come back every year in order to produce, you know, they're not annuals. These are shrubs, perennial plants, right? So you're going to have to follow that. But short of that sort of thing, I, I'm really a, um, I'm really a rebel when it comes to that, because I have found that even when people say you can't grow this in Northern California, and, and we're in a weird situation anyway, because we're like in the foothills, so California itself, you know, especially Southern California, very, very different climate than Northern California. We get cold, you know, and I mean, even where we are, you know, we'll get snow, whatever. Um, 
And I, I just find that I like to try things. And so I'll take certain things and we have this whole area, not so much right where I am, but not too far down the road. We have what we call the banana belt. And for some strange reason, they can grow like orange trees and stuff there. Like they don't die. No one knows why, you know, but it's just this heat wave area that goes through there. Right. And that can be at your own home too. It can be something like that, or it can just be the side of a building and the heat coming off that building keeps some plant right there alive that really shouldn't be in, in your area alive. And so I like to try different things because um, if it's not too extreme, I think, well, I bet I can find a spot somewhere over here where I can nurture it in such a way or create a situation, you know, planting something high on a hill is going to give a different exposure than planting it on the north side of the hill or the south side of the hill. So I like to just test things out and, um, and also remind people too, when it comes to um, your zones, that has nothing to do with, um, with annual plants. Um, it, you know, that's going to be the, the daylight you have in your area, but it's not annuals can grow anywhere. You know, they, they produce their, they do everything in one season. So you're going to grow zinnias. It doesn't matter what their hardiness zone is. It makes no difference. Zinnias are going to grow and flower all in one season, produce their seed. So just, you know, not getting people too hung up on that, but if you're going to plant, you know, trees and shrubs and things that then it would become, you know, more important. But I like taking these tiny, you know, areas and, and i have a great very interesting property because in the front it's like blazing sun and then in the back we have all these many many it's like an oak forest and so we can grow camellias and things because we've got a lot of the shade and you know stuff like that so um it's fun finding those different areas and figuring out but even in a small area you know creating microclimates can mean life or death for whatever you know and just experimenting with it is great. I absolutely love that. And that's how I read it out in the book as well. One step further, I mean, I just was at COP27 last year in November in, in Shaman Sheikh, Egypt. Desert, probably degraded as, as much as it can be. The Sinai regions just wow. horrific. But in the middle of that, uh, I'm unbelievable desertified area, basically sand, very, very, very strong sand. Um, there's this great organization called Seekem. It's a, a group of Germans that left and went to, um, to Egypt. To, they're originally from there, but they were living in, in Germany to start biodynamic farming. And you, you discuss biodynamic yeah. farming and in your book as well. It's the old Rudolf Steiner biodynamic farming, you know, uh, really great. And they started in, in the desert. There's before pictures and you see sandstorms and just sand everywhere. You're like, uh, this is impossible. Now it's like an o oasis. It's a green, the temperature is cooler there because of the plants and trees that they've planted there. Uh, it throws up all sorts of moisture into the air at uh, those plants respirate and per precipitate every single day. They capture carbon, they lock it into the soils. They also exhaust oxygen. They do mm -hmm. a plethora of things, plants and trees that they use in this, in this form. And it's totally changed, you know, from the extreme um, climate mm -hmm. in, into, into an oasis where the temperature is measurable. And they've done other examples where um, same same situations where there's huge deserts where they've just planted some trees and shrubs on each side of the road of a, a you know an asphalt road that's going through the middle of the desert, and the temperature variations from that, even though there's an asphalt street right you know running right down the the middle of where they planted us, is much different than just bare sand or 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 soil that is left open that doesn't have cover on it um, and the temperature differences. And it's amazing how we can control that as well in our, in our yes. gardens. Even if we're in the middle of, of a city, we, 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 before we started the recording, we, we talked a little bit about Ron Finley, the gangster garden in, in Los Angeles, who's planting uh, um, 
edible food on the sidewalks, you know, on the streets and was right. went and talked to the city councils and things to kind of to do that plant things that we can put to use and eat and provide us with shade and different things. So we need to just feel that empowerment of what benefits that it can do and also change our climate and what we do. And I read that out in your book that you really kind of give people this playful art to um, create their, their own gardens, to create what they would like to see, to improve that. And in that process, there's and having the right tools in your book, there's this this transformation, this experience that really happens. Uh, and that goes back to the, the first question that I kind of asked you is, during this time of craziness, I've seen so many more people to say, hey, you know, I, I would like to have a little bit more security, plant more tomatoes in my garden, plant more cucumbers or zucchini or squash or or to do some more uh, perennials in, in in my yard and and reap the benefit. I even know people who um, don't even have a yard in their homes, in their kitchens. They're doing, you know, sprouting and all different yeah. kinds of things to say, I, I, I want to do something on my own to kind of to watch it grow. And uh, it's just beautiful to see that. And I think your, your book in, inspires that going throughout. Um, would you recommend if somebody wants to set out on this path that they kind of take a step back first and do a little design and planning? Or what are your recommendations for the absolute beginner who's experienced some of these things and says, you know, I don't, I, I, roses die in my house. How, how am I going to do a garden? You know, I, I can't even keep a, a, a rubber plant or a, a plant alive in my home. How, how do I expect to do the garden? What's your advice for those people just starting out and, and what, what would be some of the first steps that you would recommend for them? Right. Well, you know, um, the first thing I would always look at is, is what you want, like what, what in your mind's eye, what is it that you, because if you always start off with what you really want, um, that you're going to, you're going to really get into it and dig into it, you know, deeper. Um, as far as your yard goes, I always recommend that people get an idea and you'd have to do this, you know, it, most people are talking about spring and summer gardening predominantly, right? Um, as opposed to, you know, in the winter, all the winter gardening is awesome. Um, but to go outside and take a picture at eight o'clock in the morning of that area that you want to garden in or the several areas and then take one at noon and take one at four. And you're going to start to see where you're going to get the most light because what is full sun, six hours or more of full sun, right? And then and then maybe what gets shaded, like maybe you only have sun till about 11 o'clock. Now you've got this nice little dappled shade or part shade area where some other plant might be happier. Um, so at least knowing how much light um, that you're having those areas, you know, that's going to be your best bet. And the other thing is, of course, um, you know, consider bringing in some compost when you go to start always, because that's going to be very helpful. Um, and um, and I practice no-till um, gardening where I don't disturb the soil structure, you know, so that's like something I don't do. I don't dig down. I build up. Um, not everything has to have sides, by the way, um, at my home um, in the Bay Area. In the backyard, we had taken down to trees and we had done you know logs around it we filled soil up in that first so going and buying lumber lumber isn't necessary i mean you can and it looks very neat um but um but basically you know doing you know doing that kind of stuff knowing what you have and what you want to plant if you just want to experiment and try things i always say start with herbs because herbs are like so forgiving they they grow everywhere you know, they just, they're really, really good. Um, there's something that want to, you know, and that speaking of wanting to stay alive, that's something people don't tell you too. I think as a beginning gardener, a lot of people think that plants, you know, oh, how do I really care for this plant? You do need to know how much sun it needs. You do need to water it. This is all true. But the thing is, plants are engineered to grow. They are on your side. They want to grow. <laughs> like, it's amazing. If you've ever seen the little things coming out of the cracks of sidewalks, you know. I mean, these things want to reproduce themselves. They want to be alive. So really, the plant's on your side, and they try real hard to survive. <laughs> they try to help you. 
So, um, you know, and as far as the roses thing, I just have to throw this in there because this is something I've always meant to write an article about. You know, those roses they sell in the grocery store, they're real pretty and they're decorative and that, you know, and they you bring them in your house. So you give them as gifts and people go, oh, they died. I mean, I want her. Oh my gosh, you guys, roses can't live in the house ever in a million years. I don't care how cute and tiny and adorable and they look like houseplants. They are not houseplants. They hate it in the house. So it's so sad. People have them on their kitchen table. Do that for like seven days and then go plant them outside, you know, because they can't live in the house. And now watch, I'll get a lot of people like emailing me going, I don't know. but I'm telling you, no, they're not. They're dead. You know, they're dead. You're lying. <laughs> like they hate it so i feel so bad because my article was really going to be about how these little roses are sold to die <laughs> they grow to their yeah, little they lives are, really they're, sad. they're gonna die so I, it makes me sad <laughs> so get them yeah off i mean that's probably a whole a whole nother book or another topic <laughs> I, I i go to thailand and in india quite a bit and and the crazy thing is that uh, culturally in some religions, they do a lot of flower offerings, you know, and so yeah. there's there are there's some flowers that are grown every single day that are just put up at these shrines. And then depending on what big temple or shrine that there that there is around the world, that every hour, depending on the number of visitors, there's these other people that come come by as the new tourists or the new uh, people who are going to the temple to or the shrines to make their offerings, then sweep all those flowers, you know, right into a garbage can and then haul it off. And so it's got a, this, you know, it's this uh, um, short life cycle, but it's, I really think we could be doing a lot better with our resources and, and our, and our yeah. things. And I understand the, uh, the traditions and cultures on that. But yeah, the rose. A lot of roses are bred to, to go die on your kitchen table or in in, on, in your yeah. loved one's you know table or you know. Yeah, right. it's sad. Right. Yeah, <laughs> I think a lot of indoor plants are I, honestly they're you know well there a lot of the indoor plants obviously we grow for homes are tropical right so you know they're they're living in the tropics we bring them indoors and uh, and you know they do a really good job surviving most of the time but. You are really creating an artificial situation. I, I honestly, I find outdoor gardening sometimes easier, unless you find a great little spot in your house where your plant's super happy. But but really, um, outdoor gardening I I think is almost easier in in some ways. Um, you know, obviously I'm not planting too many tropicals out there. Um, my environment doesn't really allow that anyway. So, um, but you know, but still, I always like. Yeah, I'd rather kind of plant things outdoors and keep them alive than try to, you know, I do have house plants, but they, they all found their little spot and then that's where they stay. <laughs> if you move them around too much, it gets a little crazy. So, so one yeah. thing I really liked about the book is um, as you get further into it, uh, it talks a lot about pests. It talks about weed control, but it, all, it, it also tells you that depending on what you plant is also what can attract certain things, a certain insects, certain pollinators, certain right. pests sometimes, depending on what you have, what kind of animals you keep, or if you decide to, to bring animals, you know, chickens or rabbits or, right. or ducks or whatever into, into your system as well, into your, into your garden, um, that those are all, whether it's a plant or an animal, those are all something that will attract something. Maybe right. attract more water, maybe attract more sunlight, maybe it'll shade more, maybe, you know, maybe it'll attract a certain pollinator or a certain uh, insect. Um, so now I, I, I like it because if you've gotten so far and you're like, oh, I already did, but I didn't read that section yet. And so I've already, I've kind of planted some things that are working against me. How do I control? How do I can, how can I change that or kind of attract the right things so that it's an ecosystem? I have a nice balance. Not right. too much of my stuff is getting eaten and, and there's balance. And you, you go through that balance and that harmony and discuss how, how that works. Um, 
what have, what is your what led you to, to write that? But what what really uh, has been your experience on on what you've dealt over the years with not only your own garden but others you've talked to and kind of seen? Is it after the fact that they always go back and, and say, or do do some of us start from the beginning trying to plan it out as a designer? So I I also studied with. Bill Mollison and Jeff Lawton, permaculture design in Australia and Tasmania. And they really teach you before you get going, let's design it. Let's think of it. Let's take those pictures and and find out right. what we're working with. And then let's right. move forward. Not everybody does it that, no. that way, especially in the home gardens. Yeah. And, you know, and, and then that's what I love that point because um, if you're just starting a garden, uh, certainly you can start from scratch and really do a lot of research and, and all that. But most people really aren't, especially in urban and suburban areas. Um, predominantly, there's an existing landscaping of some sort, um, either by the builder, if it's a brand new home, or by the previous owners who have been there. So usually we're working with um, these bones from other other people and other things. And so for me, it's an evolution. And I think I even talk about, um, you know, in, in the book is that I'm not really, um, I'm really, uh, uh, how would you say, I'm a realist in, in a whole lot of ways. I mean, I'm a dreamer for sure, but I'm a realist. So I look at things like, I, I try not to plant things ever that are invasive. That's like a big no-no for me. Like I don't want, you know, and what I want to mention, too, is some things, and I mentioned this all the way through the book, some things are invasive in some areas and not in others. I have a catalpa tree out here. And people are like, oh, those are so invasive. Mm, never happened here. I don't know. Uh, look, there's no, they're not, they're not invasive where I am. Um, we've got the one catalpa tree down here and then way up at the top of the one more, no other catalpa. So for me, that's okay. It's all good. Um, for somewhere else, it may not be good. So I don't like to plant things that are invasive. That's something I steer clear of because they don't want it pushing out our native, you know, trees and shrubs. Um, but I don't mind so much about something that is necessarily non-native as long as it is not something invasive, which specifically talks about pushing our native things out. That's a very different from something that just, you know, isn't native here, but is planted here. And in some respects, I find it almost impossible. Again, I'm going to get a lot of emails if I say this. Um, I I disagree when someone says, well, I, have, I only have natives. That's all I have. It's like, well, then what you did was is you moved to a place that had all the natives there. Maybe you live in the woods of an area with all natives. Awesome. That's really cool. But you can't have a vegetable garden and plant all natives. It is not going to happen. You do not have one native yeah. plant in your vegetable garden, y'all. It, you don't. And it's the same with herbs. It's the same. So if you're growing for food, all your plants are not going to be native. So what I just make sure is they're not invasive. Like mint is a really good one. Oh, my goodness, mint. Mint will take over the United States of America. Mint is, is like that guy on The Last of Us. You know, it's like the takes over everything. So if I want mint, I have it in a big round pot on a table on, on cement. <laughs> so it can't go under and start to creep out under and grow, you know, um, it's just a really, really crazy plant. So I just kind of do that because I'm like, I don't want everything taken over by this. So, um, so I'm just a real realist about it. You are usually going to start with something else already there. And you can slowly take away things that you don't want. Um, but then also things that aren't causing harm, but that are very lovely. You like it. Maybe it's bringing a lot of shade in an area you need. Then, the, you know, then you're just adding things to what you're doing. It's really for me about learning. It's really just about learning what you might do next to improve on the area you're in. Because any improvement, you know, and, you know, and a lot of my book really talks about, you know, any improvements that you're making, changes you're making for the positive, if you do them in such a way that you're respectful and you are inclusive, talk to people about these things, you might be able to get some neighbors involved in doing the same thing. And then then you're really helping the ecosystem because you're spreading it throughout your neighborhood. So that's a big thing for me. 
Yeah, that is a big thing. How 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 would you uh, address or um, speak to people who are maybe in, in suburbia? They're in a planned urban development or a, a, a HUD development, or it's pretty planned out suburban development somewhere uh, in the United States, and and um, there's not a lot of indigenous anything. There's not a lot of heirloom anything in the area, not a lot of natural growth. It's pretty much uh, the the typical planted lawn type of yard, but they want to turn it into something. Uh, right. There's this big talk about um, indigenous microorganisms. What's, you know, what's heirloom to the area? What's, right. what's natural for this area, even though we're talking su- suburbia somewhere? Um, right. Um, how how do we one get that indigenous microorganism back into the compost, the soil, into what you want to build up something that's there, and then properly gauge that? Or do you have some tools that we can kind of look and judge and, and find that out? What's what's your rule of thumb, and how how do you would you advise people in, in that situation? Right. Well, you know, um, I would become involved or just or just you know reach out to a native plant society in your area they're they're so great with this and and one of the things that they're really good at and it's a great question that you're saying because some of these native plants like some of the native plants i have here they're they're not going to be how would you say you know they're not overly decorative they're not going to be something that people go wow that looks terrific can i copy that and put that in my yard um, that's not necessarily noticeable a lot of the time. A lot of these native shrubs and stuff are very nondescript and that sort of thing. And you might not find, you know, anything that's attractive that way. But the native plant societies, they are very good and they have, you know, different sales during the year, different people kind of growing these things. Um, and they actually, you know, have like a list and stuff of plants that are actually just lovely and interesting and, but supportive of exactly the the insects and the native even the native mammals and the critters the birds that belong in your area the native uh caterpillars which of course those caterpillars are going to call in the birds that belong in your area all of these things um but they're a lovely plant that goes in your yard and you're thinking you know ceanothus is one that i really love for california ceanothus is amazing uh beautiful plant and um you know and when you look at places like that, that actually specialize in it, sometimes it's a little easier than hunting it down yourself. Like, oh, what are some native plants for this area? You're going to get lots of lists of what really would be there had your development not come in and done all this. And you can also visit, you know, some of the um, preserves around your area and you'll see some of those. But again, they're going to be a little more of the, um, how would you say, the original species, which aren't always as uh you know aesthetically pleasing for yards as maybe the some of the the ones that are being developed now that are still very very viable for the area but maybe have a nice little you know look about them so i would always reach out to those societies and i know here in california we have a couple of uh, native plant nurseries i mean there's not that many but you know there are a few and they're super helpful so they're good places to reach out to Absolutely. I love that. I love that uh, you gave that suggestion. I work a lot with uh, the John Lewis ecosystem restoration camps and, and even more so now he, he was also on a podcast. We're seeing a big uptake around the world um, with people kind of trying to restore the world, trying to restore our earth to get it back to health. And I gave you the example in Egypt where they're trying to take a desert and get it back to some right. state where it was thriving and flourishing, uh, you know, decades, centuries before, but into another state where we lower the temperatures and we kind of restore those ecosystems instead of, you know, giving up and saying we need to move elsewhere. The, the reason I bring that up is, uh, you're, you know, you've spoken a couple of times about California. California is really interesting because there's a lot of people um, in these urban or these areas that are now being displaced as climate refugees in the United States right. because of the wildfires of the fires and things that are be going on. I mean, we could take another example, not even in the United States, the 
the brush fires in Australia, you know, where they have the big brush mm-hmm. fires also kind of based around farming, based around climate change, different things where just just regular people who, who probably have a garden, who probably have a nice setup, they're living on a small, you know, one acre, half acre, maybe sometimes up to, you know, five acre properties, uh, a little bit more forestry um, that are now being displaced because of these brush fires. How do you think by them gardening, doing a little homesteading, by doing a little restoration in the area where they live, they could do some prevention or restoration to, to avoid some of those things. Do you think that's possible in the practice of gardening and and some of the things that you discuss? Well, I think, I think it is. I think that um, part of that is, of course, I know in our area, we try to plant things that are a little more non-flammable. Now it's super interesting because like we had, we have a lot of manzanita around here. Manzanita is highly flammable. So, and it's native to California. And in fact, it can't procreate without catching on fire. Ah, ironically. <laughs> so, um, so it's, it's extremely dangerous around these homes and things like that. So uh, they make us clear, you know, a hundred uh, feet from our, you know, homes. And if you have trees, they want you to make sure that the branches are trimmed up high so that, you know, if there's a fire, it'll go through the canopy and not, you know, down low. So, I mean, you know, really just, I think, the fact that you're even um, landscaping that area in such a way, it doesn't have to be landscaped in the traditional sense, but but just you planting things and letting things be watered and covering the ground, as you talked about before, to keep things moist and damp, that's obviously very helpful, you know, for fires and things like that. But then also having to be aware, if you are in a high fire area, about what you're actually planting. I think that, um, you know, like I said, there's things that you wouldn't want to put a bunch of, specific shrubs together that are highly flammable right next to your house and (laughs) like lights it up. Um, I haven't gone too deeply in exploring more of what you're saying, although it's really a a fascinating topic, especially given where I live. (laughs) We're like the fire nation over here. People talk about earthquakes. Uh, I don't, I don't necessarily see it as a full blown, you know, ecosystem restoration camp. We're actually restoring, restoring the earth, but I think it's a a even more microcosmos, smaller way of starting to kind of, first of all, raise awareness and say, wow, what can we do? But now could we even do some other things now seeing what's going on different places around the world, not just California, where um, we see that, you know, places are just going up in flames. There's some issues happening. And and a lot of these areas in, in California as well are, um, it's, it's not necessarily the trees or that the fires are started. Uh, what we're seeing now is because there's so little moisture in the ground that right. there's just the spontaneous uh, uh, combustion that occurs right out of the ground because it's so dry. There's not a lot of moss. There's not a lot of things that all of a sudden it just, you know, just start naturally. As you said, you know, that species is one that cannot go on without fire. So it's in, indigenous and it's also, you know, one that uh, is is used to that type of uh, right. pr- uh, proliferation so that it continues to propagate and, and, and continues on. But I, I think it's a, a good beginning to look at that. And there are a couple images, if I recall correctly, in your book um, of ground covering that is, is different. It's actual wood chips. So where they're chipping up some kind of bark or, or, or brown matter on the ground, which is also a good food for the soil. It's also a cover. It also captures that water. It creates a spongy feeling. It's nice to walk on, but it also lowers the temperature, but it also holds that moisture in the ground. It gives the worms and other things stuff to eat as well. Um, what What are your thoughts on, on, on non-traditional, not just planting, but other maybe other kind of ground covering? How do you build up your topsoil? Do you build that up in a separate space, obviously? But you did mention... You're building every year new topsoil. 
What are some tips and things uh, in, in your section that you can kind of give some people advice on that? What are your thoughts on on okay. those uh, directions as well? Yeah. Well, well, what, what we've done is the people that were here before us did have cattle. And so they, um, it's kind of interesting, and they haven't been here for quite a while. So what happened was, of course, the cattle spread manure everywhere. And the places where they were located has built up because that broke down, composted on its own and became kind of nice, right? So I got to start off with something kind of nice in a lot of the areas, not all of it, some of it's hard pan clay. Um, but the wood chips, I like to add like, you know, on the very top. But before that, I like to, we do our own compost, but we also have to bring in compost sometimes because we don't make enough of it. I mean, boy, when you put a big pile up there, by the time it's composted, it's way down. So it's uh, the areas we want to spread it in, it gets kind of thin. So we're constantly adding compost. And then the wood chips, that's why I love the organic stuff, is because it does eventually break down. Um, you know, all the macros come up. You know, you got your worms and everything that help break it down, the beetles, everything. And then I end up having to add more wood chips. But as all that process is happening, and it does take years. I mean, I'm not going to lie about it. I mean, it... It takes time to do that, but I cheat, you know, I do. I, I have no problem going and buying some garden soil, bringing that into a spot where I'm trying to start a brand new garden on hard pan. I bring that in with the compost and then I might cover it with wood chips or I might cover it with straw. We do have animals here. And so I'll have straw and I'll, you know, cover the ground with that. It keeps everything nice and moist as well. That also breaks down. Um, so I use all kinds of things like that. I might use, um, in a garden bed that I'm not using for the season, I might actually plant a uh, red clover or some kind of uh, legume, you know, even uh, peas or something, because they capture carbon uh, and nitrogen from the air and they keep it sequestered in the soil. When you knock it down, it releases the nitrogen into the ground and helps my next crop grow. But um, anything that, you know, even my vining plants, you know, like uh, pumpkins and things, when I grow that, boy, those leaves are huge and the vines grow everywhere. And they are also keeping the moisture down in the vegetable areas as well. So anything that I can get to shade from that sun, because we do in our sunny areas, we just have brilliant sun. That afternoon sun is insanely hot. And, you know, if you just keep that ground covered somehow, um, it really it's you know, I mean, it helps with the watering and everything. It helps you all the way around, much less, you know helping to build the soil and, you know, um, get, you know, you, as that stuff breaks down too, you know, I was going to mention too, um, there's a great flower farmer that I follow and she does this wonderful little video, uh, Lisa Mason Ziegler, and she shows how like she cuts down the sunflowers, right? But she leaves the roots and the stem. And then when she goes to plant, she just goes right next to it because those things break down and become the soil. And so that's all part of no-till. You know, that let all that go back into the earth and, and just regenerate. Um, and it's it's really amazing to, to watch that soil over the years. But it does take time. And I mentioned that in the book, too. Everybody's just got to slow down. We're all used to Amazon Prime. I get it. <laughs> you know, I get it. I'm looking, too. Hey, it's supposed to be here yesterday. What's happening? You know, but when it comes to the car, you got to, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, we stand at the microwave. Have you ever noticed that? You stand at the microwave going, come on. And you had it in there for 30 seconds. Yeah. And you're going, come on, 30 seconds. To come. <laughs> but, you know, we can't live our lives that way. I think that's what we're all discovering. The good stuff is in the slow stuff. And so once things start happening and growing, everything starts balancing out and, you know, in your gardens. And, um, and you start to find that took a little time, but it's so worth it. You know, I mean, you get all the good stuff if you slow down just a little bit. Yeah, I agree. There's yeah. uh, there's a lot of benefits, and, and I, I think it's a process. It's a journey. I mean, um, no, it's, it's not perfect. We're, we're still learning, and everybody can kind of be on that journey. And the yeah. easier it becomes, the more you learn, the better you find the tips and tricks that are in your book, I believe. Um the more you can experiment, the more you can grow, the more you can put things on kind of autopilot where you say, yeah, well, 
I know that every year now I've, I've got a routine, I've got a setup, I've got it dialed mm-hmm. in just how I want it. But but that uh, takes a little while. And uh, yeah, I love your example of the microwave. I've ri- I write about food a lot and, and have talked about food. There's only been about five really big uh, innovations in agriculture and food um, in our lifetimes. Um, and one of them w- w- was really the microwave. It was supposed to help us in the cooking process, help to make things go faster, help to, to kind of uh, be better for um, reusing leftovers, you know, warming up leftovers right. and things. And it ended up turning out to be a curse because – now, not only do we eat more, um, we, we don't always just um, heat up leftovers. We use it as to cook, you know, uh, uh, yeah. frozen foods and full meals straight in, in there instead of cooking it the slow way. And we kind of expect this quick fix so that we can go eat in front of the TV. And then when we eat, then we're like, oh, I'm not really full. Let's go back. And so people are gaining more weight and there's a lot of a lot of issues on that quick instead of using it to be more efficient or something spending more out time outside or more time gardening we actually took that extra time from that we got from the microwave and actually if uh, it hasn't always helped to our benefit but yeah I, I i love that example in your book, you also have, you know, the, the clay triangle, talk about different soil types and, and um, you know, sand, silt, and clay percentages and what the soil type looks like in, in your area. You deep dive into compost. You deep dive into uh, rain capture, so rain harvesting through barrels and, and different runoffs that you can use in your garden. You talk about, you know, how you use cover and, and build up topsoil and do things. So all, all that is there. And then you really go down into how can we, you know, use critters and animals and, and uh, how can we cultivate healthy food and, and build this community, giving people really the tools that they need step through step Um uh, and then at the end, there's this beautiful plethora of resources that if you didn't cover them, if they want to go into the the rabbit hole of environment and climate and kind of doing good for for sustainability and your environment and your yourself and your health, that you can get other tools and tips and tricks. So I, I, I really love that. What is your most important part of the book that you really love and you say, well, I absolutely had this because I've seen it over the years. And this is really probably the biggest resource that everybody needs um, that, that you would express to to the listeners. Um, You know, something that, I mean, gosh, I really wrote the book as a gateway, right? So like I talk a little about permaculture and right, but I don't, you know, I don't go all the way down those paths, hence the resources in the back, like, hey, if you want to dig deeper, right? Um, But so, I mean, I I don't know if one thing stands out other than something that I don't think I've ever gotten so much into um, vocalizing before, is talking about community and talking about how important your community is. I don't think people realize, you know, people think like, oh, you know, like, because we're all looking at our phones or we're all looking at the computers, right? But, you know, and people say, we've all gotten away. We're not really that into other people anymore. And it's very interesting to me because you say that. And yet some of the most popular things online, right? You, they're all the chat rooms. They're what we're doing right now. Hello, we're reaching out now through these through this electronics to reach other people. We are not getting away from people. It's just not true. We are still seeking it because we need it. And we need community. People were not meant to be alone. They just were not meant. um, And I don't mean that by definition of marriage or something. I mean that by reaching out to other people, even physical touch. You know, I mean, um, it's, you know, 
So I really want to express what that looks like in a suburban or urban setting, what that what that looks like to reach out to your neighbors. And, you know, people get so afraid of, you know, it's like, oh, you know, I have this compost pile and I think my neighbor think this actually happened to me. My neighbor was thinking that the flies were coming from my compost pile. She's like, you know, I think she was looking over my fence. You know, I think like maybe your compost pile smells because I think like maybe we got flies and I said, come over, come over. Now, let's see if that's what it is. Because certainly I wouldn't want that to happen. So she comes over and she's like, oh, and she's looking around. And I go, she goes, I think maybe it smells. And I'm like, really? And I stuck my hand in there and I brought it out. I go, does it smell? And she's like, oh, no, it kind of just smells like soil. <laughs> yeah, it's, flies aren't probably coming from that. Uh, you know, and, and it made her start to think like, oh, so, hey, wait a minute. So like you're growing all this stuff and you have this and it doesn't smell like, you know, and it, it, you know, it gets her start to think and maybe she might want to do it or something. So, you know, getting to share with people, some people are always going to be upset over things when they change a little bit, but um, not often. You'd be very amazed if you just talk with people what they actually listen you think maybe they're not, and they actually do. And um, and I think it's a really sad thing that we're so afraid of, uh, you know, inviting people into that circle. And, you know, by extension, I go into if you're not, you know, don't have a problem with that or you don't want to get into that or whatever, I'm getting into the citizen science, which is super fun, by the way. If, if you love nature and you want to learn more, getting into citizen science is amazing. Uh, way to, you know, and you can do things from your own garden, wa- watching the bluebirds or listening, li- literally listening to the croaking of frogs as part of it. I mean, there's so many different cool things. So just reaching out and that's all part of your community. I mean, that's also reaching out to other people and seeing what's happening in their area. And, um, you know, I just, I'm just really big on that. I don't think people talk a lot about the people around us and, you know, what it looks like to involve them or try to get them excited about what you're doing and maybe they'll do it too. So, I mean, that's, I, I think that's one of the I biggest takeaways. I think that's a beautiful yeah. takeaway and that, that, you know, that community is so, so big. I see it in, in many respects. And luckily I was fortunate, knock on wood, do to see it, you know, growing up and, and, um, to see how that community builds in the small part, but it's nice how, Children will come. I'm still not sure about that. Sorry about that. (laughs) It's really funny how community on my series listening to our podcast. um, It's funny how community um, really can be built in many ways. How children, you know, can go to their their parents or their grandparents and they say. I want us to grow pumpkins so that come Halloween we can carve a pumpkin yeah. out of our thing. Or they get real uh, excited about strawberries or or certain things, and and they, you know they're like, I want us to put this in the garden so that that we can have have this, you know, because it's something that they get on, and and that already starts to build in your own family. But I've I've seen it in. in in other respects where neighbors who don't have a garden or haven't done it, they say, Hey, would you mind planting some zucchini for me? Would you mind planting, you know, some of this, or could I get some of your extra? And it starts out, maybe you, you have, have excess on what you've grown and you just say, Oh, we've got tons of tomatoes or we're going on vacation. And they'll never eat them all. And, you know, yeah. I haven't had time to preserve them. And you give them away and the next thing you know, you've got your neighbors and your relatives, your friends and people around you hooked. And then they're coming to you and say, hey, can you plant something for me? I'd love that. And next thing you know, it just spreads like wildfire. I know people, whether it's apples or plums or whatever that they're they're growing in different places, it's like, boy, give me that. I want to dehydrate that. And. Uh, I, I want some, you know, to make some fruit leather or some dried fruits, or I want it, I want some of that for my salads, and just how that in and of itself grows communities and building. And 
during the pandemic, we saw quite a bit where those who had already been doing this for quite some time, they were able to pivot and have enough abundance to then give to their neighbors and other people who didn't, who weren't prepared and didn't have enough. Um, and even if people didn't always do that, they were able to make it through this time on a different note. They, they're they the ones who are laughing at everybody who was running to the grocery store and buying out all the toilet paper because mm -hmm. I guess they're going to ship more than usual and, and needed toilet paper or, you know, it's funny how, how many grocery stores I went to and around the world. Um, it was the same thing everywhere. So it's not culturally specific. It was that way. But in almost every one of them, when I went to the fresh food section, the produce section, yeah, there was always fresh produce there. The preserves and the canned yeah. things and, and all those things, those were empty. And the paper yeah. towels and the toilet paper were empty, the w bottled water. But you know what? There wasn't hardly one grocery. I went to quite a few during the pandemic where they were saying there's no toilet paper or bottled water, but there was sure a lot of fresh food that I would eat. Right. Get a lot of vitamins right. and nutrients. And so, um, and eventually when, when the light bulb went on for most people that that's probably the, the wrong places we need to be looking. Right. Uh, and then you realize that the fresh food and vegetables and people started cooking more and they says, yeah, the restaurants are closed down or we can't go out. Let's start cooking. And people like, I discovered people who are hidden chefs, you know, so <laughs> there's so many community things. Yeah. That I was like, yeah. well, I didn't know you could cook. And next thing you know, they're saying, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of beautiful benefits that come out of, out, out of those things that I've seen as well. And so I really, I also saw that as well. And that's why I really appreciate you talking about the, the community section yeah, uh, of, of, of your book. And, I really, I th really think it's there. And that really leads me to the hardest question I have for you today. Oh, no. It's one that I, I, yeah, it's the, the one that I ask all of my guests and it really ties to, to that, uh, building a community into life. It's, um, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you and just for you, not for me, not for your government, not your husband. What does it look like for you? Well, for me, I mean, very, very specifically, I think it, 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 it looks like people who value the natural world and which includes human beings. So if we can value living things, for me, that that's really the answer to everything. It's the root of everything. And it starts very locally. So that for me, that's what I try to focus on is to get people to realize that they can um, not only be, you know, respectful and value their own ecosystem, their own area, but that they can encourage people around them. And that's, that's how everything spreads. That's how everything is going to get better and change is if we actually do it right where we're standing right now. And you don't have to be a, you know, somebody that has a lot of land or a lot of uh, influence in the world at all because just your single influence is gonna make an impact. So again, I think it's just valuing, you know, our natural world is probably, yeah, that's probably my answer. I absolutely love that. That's great. Thank you. That, that you, yeah. ding, 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 you got the right answer. You did it, so. <laughs> Sorry about that. that. <laughs> You're fine. Yeah. yeah, no, that's a perfect answer. Um, there, there's some great things coming down the line for you. Um, we can't talk about all of them, but basically you are working on some, some interesting things that we, we are hopefully can look forward to as around creative living and kind of giving people tools and ideas, how to be creative and, and creating not only creative living, but lifestyles, creative lifestyles. How do you build right. a lifestyle for yourself? Uh, um, wh where do you find the tools? How do you do it? How do you do that? And, and that's dear and near to, to me as well, to my heart. My, I, I have a foundation. It's called the Alohas Regenerative Foundation. 
Aloha says, has a special meeting. A lot of people think it's the Hawaiian greeting. No, that that's Aloha. Uh, I, I, mine is Aloha, and it's a, it's an acronym for Adaptive Lifestyle of Health and Sustainability. And the key factor in there is lifestyle. How can we create a lifestyle that that works for us, works for community, works for our family, and works for mm-hmm. other? Um, that is one that that has all the systems and all the factors of food, water, climate, cool temperatures, not too hot, not too cold, that uh, it is a, is a beautiful lifestyle to live. And how does it support our, the lifestyle that we kind of separate ourselves out into in the world? Sometimes we have, we're living one thing at work and we're living a different way at, in our personal lives at home. And we kind of separate those things and we talk about this work-life balance, but there is no work-life balance. It's all life. There is no separation. You're one person at work and you're one person as you're gardening and another person at your church. If you were, you would probably be bipolar or triple polar because (laughs) it just doesn't exist. You'd be a different person every time. It's all, you're all the same person. That's all part of the, this beautiful gift of life. And so, I, I love that you that you bring up that in lifestyle. So I know we're going to be, I don't know if you can tell us or tease a little bit what you're working on, but I know we should watch for something great coming your way. Yeah, I think, I think yeah, it's, um, it's going to be, it's called From Scratch Online, and it's a takeoff of the magazine we had done before, but it'll be a different platform sort of thing. Um, and it's just extending itself from, uh, just from, from scratch was a uh, homestead, modern homestead thing. We kind of taken it farther this time and really talking about the creativity of human beings and, and it, even how that connects to our, um, our emotional and mental health as well. Not so much getting deep into that, like, you know, try, um, it's not like psychologists or something. It's more about how human beings doing these creative things and living a creative lifestyle Um, and how that works with who we are as people. And even if you don't think of yourself as creative, you are, you're creating all the time. And so, um, you know, just gives people a lot of tools and things to do that with. And it could be things from your garden, from, you know, bringing them in and doing things. It could be anything, it could be sewing, could be whatever. Um, We would want to get into kids. um, Oh gosh, we have something on there that is uh, tracking animals and um, having kids take plaster of Paris out with them and, and, you know, making the plaster animal tracks so they can take those home and look at them and try to figure out what kind of maybe bird that might've been or something that was hopping on the ground or, you know, so really it's, it's intentional living. And, and so all of this goes together, everything you're saying, you know, is it's really being intentional about your life. And so that's kind of where we're going with it. And I, I hope we're, I think we'll be live in June. And so great. Really great. Well, we're not going to push you. We know it takes yeah. it time. We'll take it slow and, yeah. but we'll, we'll be watching for something for you. I only have uh, two more questions for you and, and, and then we're done. So there, you know, we, I didn't really talk too much, but you've already all laughing crow company is, is that correct? Is your company as well? Oh, you know what? That's our farm. Is that correct? Laughing Crow and Company. Yeah, our farm. It's our farm name. Laughing yeah. Crow and Company. That's yeah, your farm. So, wow. Yeah. So when you go to that website, if someone goes there, that's just our farm website. And eventually I'll lead you to the other new one. But that's where you can find me for sure. Email me anything like great, that. Great, great. Yeah. So, so, so that wasn't my two questions, but I just want to make sure. And we'll put in the show descriptions all your links and, and information to get uh, – um, a hold of you and watch for things coming out in the future, as well as to see the links to your other books as well. Um, if there was one message that you could depart to the new gardener uh, or the uh, gardener's been around kind of doing this for a while, that would have the power to change their gardening future. Would you have one message or maybe even a couple messages that you would love to depart to those people? Um, Well, one, like I said before, having patience and letting things that you've put into motion have a chance to work because it isn't a microwave. It's not Amazon Prime. It's just it's it's much more natural than that. Um, And, you know, 
nature is a little slower, but it always gets done, I'll tell you. Um, but the other thing is how we look at perfection. That's really important to me, what perfection actually looks like. And when you have a beautiful tomato plant and it's producing a bunch of tomatoes um, and you have two leaves that are eaten by a, a cutter leaf bee, who's just building his, their nest. And actually, they're going to stop pretty soon once they've got that nest going. Um, you know, honestly, that's not damage, guys. It's just, it's just simply not damage. That's the ecosystem at work. Your garden is part of the ecosystem. So the way we see perfection, it's perfect for the bees. It's perfect for you. You got your tomatoes. Your tomatoes are fine. So some of those leaves are eaten and, and everything's fine for them. Everything's fine for you. That's perfection. Um, it isn't um, Instagram posts that we see that are, you know, and that isn't to knock Instagram posts, okay? <laughs> we love to look up that beautiful stuff, and that's great. But I'll tell you, point of view, that's how you get those, okay? You just angle that particular leaf out of the photo, get that shot of the beautiful tomato. You have your Instagram post, and you have also a beautiful garden working with, with uh, the ecosystem as well. So really, I just want people to... to leave that perfection you were taught was perfection at the garden gate and look at everything new and see how that, what perfection. Really yeah. Is. yeah. I totally agree. I, I, I think that perfection thing is um, nature is perfect and it is a wonderful ecosystem, especially if we let it all work together in, in a very diverse and abundant um, system so yeah. that the systems of systems are all kind of interplaying with each other. Uh, everything usually plays out and you've given some good advice and tips within your book to kind of go through and tell everybody, you know, uh, what are some of the pitfalls? What if you have these certain pests or these insects and, and things that you don't want? How can we naturally get a, get rid of them without pesticides and herbicides and any kind of horrible chemicals? that just come back to, to hurt us in the end. So I, I love the, those advice. I, I I don't run into that as much. I've I've been farming and gardening for a long time. Probably the the worst I've ever had is um, fungus, fungus, oh. fruit flies, fungus flies that I've had before that are kind of just a, an annoyance, but they're not really that, yeah. that big of a deal um, right. and, o over the years. But, but really the, biggest heartfelt thing that, that bothers me the most and, and no matter what I do is, is, is waste. If I've spent the time growing something and, and put that in, that if I can't, if I, if I lose something, if it goes bad, if it, it doesn't, doesn't get put back in the system or if I can't eat it in time or if I can't give it away or, you know, right. if I don't get it picked in time and you see it, you know, fall onto the ground and rot before you can do something with it. That's the biggest thing for me. Yeah. But the positive benefit is, is it can go back to compost. It can yeah. go back to the ground. It can go back to the soil, which is also helpful. It can go to the chickens. It yeah. can go to the ducks. It can go go to um, different uh places, you know, if you have pigs or whatever you have. Um, so there's a lot of other options that benefit. But I just hate, you know, when when nature presents you with such a good thing that, that somehow you don't always capture it. But in nature, that's just part of the, the big cycle. You're not yeah. always going to get all of it. But as long as it gets back into that system and it feeds the soil and that it's great, I do. Uh, th this is a little bit separate, which is interesting, um, but but it's also tied to that. I do an indoor thing, and when you you mentioned about the roses and things, whenever you bring something indoor, it's really not always meant for that. But I do uh, water kefir, so it's like a kombucha almost, but it's called water kefir, and so the actual cultures of those. Every time I make a new batch, because it's a living. It grows. It gets more. I just don't have enough friends surrounding me to come every time I make a new batch to take my leftovers to, you know, just come and say, okay, here, I used to save it quite a bit. And, and you know, I, I think I had five jars of extra cultures, but eventually it, it, it's a living thing. It just yeah. keeps going and going and going. Right. And you can, you know, you can put it, but it, 
almost breaks my heart to say, no, I've got it. You know, I'm going to throw it away or put it out on the compost and, right. you know, uh, figure out something else to do with it. But it just breaks my heart because it's abundant. And uh, yeah. I guess what I'm saying is in, in the short term of things is in all living systems, all biology, ecology, all living systems, one plus one, never, ever, ever, ever equals two. It's a super exponential. It's something life is abundant and it grows. And there is a divine system out there that really shows us that. And so I, I, I love that you, you know, you express and, and talk about that and, and, and how, you know, we, we should understand it. Let's slow down. Let's realize it's not perfect and make it work for us in the long run. The last question I have for you is what have you learned in this journey in your writing, your experience in the farm and your acreage and, and uh, what you've done so far that you would have loved to know from the start. You say, boy, if I would have known that, I'd, you know, um, yeah. what would it be? Um, gosh, if I had known that from the beginning, um, I can tell you just while you're thinking it's for, for most of the people say, well, nothing, because I love the journey and I was part, yeah. part of the journey. Yeah. The, the thing that I personally say is I wish I would have known sooner. I would have started sooner. If I would have had that wisdom sooner of how, right. how great it could be, I would have started a lot sooner and made sure to, to put that path there. But um, for well, everybody, it's kind of different, but what would for you? Yeah, for me, you know, it's funny. Um, I, unfortunately, um, I have a perfectionist personality, which I don't enjoy um, because it, it, you know, I'm hard on myself. And, you know, if I don't do it right, then I think, ah, you should have known that. And I get really, you know, uh, that's just, it, it's just part of how I am. Sometimes it stops me from doing things. I think, well, if I can't do it exactly right. So what I have learned is, I mean, this is like, honestly is, is do something, you know, and, and that's like, even in my book, you know, honestly, I tell people like to do things that are sustainable, to do things that make a good garden, you don't have to do all of it. Say you're just not interested in composting. I get it. I mean, I love it, but you know, maybe you just want to do something else, just bring in some compost for your thing, but you don't want to feel like that. Okay. So you're going to give it to someone else to compost or whatever, but maybe you've decided you're going to quit using pesticides. That's going to be like, you're, you're like, you know what? This makes sense to me. I, 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 you know, I'm reading this book and I think this does call to me. I'm going to do that. So do that. You don't have to do every single thing the way everybody says it has to be done. Choose what speaks to you. I know for a fact that more will speak to you once you do that. I, I know that that's just, it's how it is. Um, and so I think that really that's, I mean, I wish that I would have realized I didn't back then have to know every tiny thing before starting something. You just, you just don't. And when you do it, it unfolds. It just like unfolds before you like this road. And, you know, and so what happens is you didn't get to do that really cool, fun stuff that got to teach you, you, you learn that much slower because you didn't go for it. So for me, if you go for it, you learn things much faster. You learn about things much faster, how you can do things different or better or more to your liking or more to nature's liking if you just start. So, you know, I say, I wish I would just, you know, I really wish I would have done things faster. Just go for it. Don't worry about everything. <laughs> No worries. Chris, thank you for letting us all inside of your ideas. It has been a sheer pleasure um, to, to kind of go over and review The Good Garden, your book, uh, together with you and to, to get your insights and your wisdoms. I am looking forward for the new things that come out uh, in the future from you. And I thank you very much. And that's all I have, unless you oh, have any questions for no, me before I, I say goodbye. I just wanted to thank you so much for having me. It's been really fun being here and I, I really enjoyed it a lot. So I thank you. You're most welcome. And, and I know when you've done many books before, so maybe we'll have to have you come back and give us a little, little update on feedback yeah. that you got. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you. you take care. Thanks. You too.